people to give me the most money this past month. That sort of thing, that has now become sort of phrased in the analytics application. It used to be called a reporting application, but now it's called the analytics. Um, some people call it big data. Um, if somebody refers to big data, that's usually in the class of thing that they're referring to. They're not talking about how big their data actually is. They're talking about how they're able to get answers from it. So that's usually what we're talking about when we talk about analytics. And usually it has, uh, kind of as I refer to here, I'm sorry if I'm standing in front of this, that's actually a terrible presenter thing to do. Can you guys see that? <laughs> um, so it's usually a little bit of business intelligence. Sometimes it has something to do with software metrics too, like you actually care about the performance of your application along with your, the, your business metrics. You get a little bit of both mixed in there. Um, that's a lot of data to deal with over time because your computers are running all the time. They're gonna be generating data all the time. Hopefully you have customers all the time as well. So why would you need to build one of these things? Um, because you have a job, man. Uh, <laughs> so uh, why would you need to build one of these things? Um, usually because you've already sort of built one. Like we already have a perfectly good ad hoc reporting thing and it's called SQL. Like SQL, active record, built on top of it. If you're writing a Rails app and you're doing that thing, it's able to pull out answers from your database, like tell me who are the top 10 customers from this past month. That works fine at small scales. As the customers start to grow, it doesn't work so great. At some point, the amount of time to get that answer becomes way higher than anybody's actually willing to wait for. So, hopefully nobody's terrified of SQL. This query here, which is a terrible query, this query here takes longer than 30 seconds. That's when somebody says, I've heard about these analytics applications. They're supposed to make this thing easier, and I don't have to wait for answers anymore. Could somebody build one for me? Or if you're really unlucky, they'll say something like, I've heard about Hadoop, and I want you to bring Hadoop into my experience. <laughs> if you haven't heard about Hadoop, it's terrible. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very large application that purports to handle lots of data and give you answers about this sort of thing, but it does it in a very hard way. So. Now you get to choose. You're gonna build an application, and you get to ch take one of two paths. You get to work really hard and optimize the thing you've already got. You've got SQL, you've got Active Record, you've got a Rails app, you're gonna to try to build something that's gonna produce answers for the people that are in charge of the business. Or you're going to try to pick something that purports to solve all these problems for you. You're gonna pick something like Hadoop. You're gonna pick something like, if you've heard about databases like Vertica or Redshift, these things take in lots of data and they handle it relatively well and give you back answers. They're analytics databases, and that's, it seems like that might solve the problem. So we're sort of in the situation where we have to build software to handle some sort of problem because it takes too long to get the answers with what we've currently got. That's the situation we're in right now. And this, how you get yourself out of this situation is by introducing constraints. It's not by choosing one of, one of two ways to get out of it, not by choosing an analytics package, not by trying to optimize your existing software, but instead trying to understand the data that you've got. And when we talk about constraints, the, the issue that we, or the, the thing that we do here is by introducing ways to understand how our data actually works and introducing ways that people can only get these answers. By removing flexibility, it makes it easier for us to build an analytic system that can handle what, what our business owners want. So hopefully, if you're starting here and you're gonna build an analytics application, you have questions that you need to ask. Like, how often does the data change? Does your data change a lot? Are people adding new data every day? Are they changing the details of that data? Does the data need to be real time? And if it does need to be real time, I'm sorry, and also, I'm sorry that somebody asked for that thing. Does the total amount of data fit into a single machine's memory? Do you even know how much data you actually have? How much data is in your database? When somebody says we have big data and you have 100 customers, what, what does that mean? Like 100 customers is not big data. You know, 1,000 customers, even a million customers, is in a way of thinking about it, a million people, while it's a relatively large number, a million fits into one megabyte. Like we can fit a million into one megabyte of RAM, which is next to nothing on a machine. It's not that big. How do we how do we think about our data? Like what does where are we able to fit it when we introduce constraints? 
And how fast does your data grow? Do you know how many new customers you get on a daily basis? Do you know how many people are adding data to your site over, day, over time? That's gonna introduce new constraints. That's gonna determine where you can actually put this thing. Can it fit on a machine for the next 10 years? Is that a viable path? Because probably in 10 years, the software will be replaced. That's entirely okay. And do you know in advance all the questions you intend to answer with an analytics application? Like the people that actually want the answers or reporting, do they know all the reports they're ever going to need? Do they only need to know one thing or are they gonna need to actually ask questions ad hoc over time? Do they need something that's terrifyingly like SQL? Or do they just need a simple reporting dashboard? And can you tolerate approximate answers? If you can answer these sorts of questions, uh, when I say approximate answers, what I mean is that can you tolerate sort of that data? Like, it's right within 5%. If you can ask these questions and get answers from the people that are asking you to build the software, it lets you cut down the problem space. It lets you cut down these relatively insurmountable problems so you don't have to think about performance. You don't have to think about making it fast because you let the other person determine which things you don't need to care about. Instead of trying to make something that's not very fast, like, I mean, frankly, Ruby is not super fast. If you, if you are able to cut down the problem space, you don't have to worry about making it fast because you don't have to worry about dealing with that much data. You, you deal with the performance problem by removing the problem. So all those questions, we're talking about data. And we're not talking about databases. We're not talking about, can you pick a faster database? Or is there a faster database on the market? We're not talking about things like it's massively scalable or something like somebody would perhaps inter introduce uh, something like, as I spoke earlier, Hadoop, and say Hadoop is massively scalable. It can scale across many machines. I do it with thousands of jobs all the time. It doesn't matter. Those things aren't really what we're talking about. We don't want to worry about the fastest possible thing that can solve our problem. We want to worry about how we can cut down the problem space. Because if we can cut down the problem space, it doesn't really matter what the software is. So, total fire hose, you got all of it. We'll just go straight to an example, which might help a little bit. So, I'm a programmer named Nardbark. I have to build analytics for my Jetpack business. My manager reviews a monthly report that tells them who the top 10 customers are for each of the past 12 months. We have 200,000 customers. The page that loads of this report takes five minutes to run. It takes five minutes, the manager is super upset that I have to wait five minutes to actually get the top 10 <coughs> of the month. What do I need to do? Do I need to actually build an analytics solution? Not really. Like you can talk your way out of that immediately by saying there's no system necessary, what you need is caching. You just cache a page. Five minutes is nothing. You don't need to introduce any new software. You don't need to introduce a new database. You don't even need to worry about a relatively large project. If the person only looks at it once a month, cut down the problem space on the virtue of what the viewer does or what the reader does. The read behavior determines what the system needs to do, not trying to optimize the system, not introducing a new system that's faster. Also, you know, check out database indexes, they're awesome. Um, maybe you have a little bit more data. Maybe you have two million customer records selling handlebar mustaches to Pokemon. Um, you're adding about 8,000 to 10,000 customers a day. That's a pretty healthy growth rate. You should be happy about that. Your CTO wants to run SQL queries to research user behavior, but honestly, you're terrified to touch the database because tons of people are writing to it right now. You could bring the server down just because the CTO thought that a query was optimized and it wasn't. This does happen. So, <laughs> it's, it's terrible for the presentation, but I really like it. <laughs> so, you still don't need a new system. You've already, like, by virtue of stating the problem, the, the solution presents itself and that you just add a replica for the for the data. Even if it ends up being rebuilding a new database entirely from a backup, that's fine. You don't need to make the system any faster. You don't need to build anything new. You don't need to build an analytics application. Just give the CTO a database where they can do SQL and play around and ignore production. And it's fine. But these are techniques that you can avoid having to even build these analytics applications to build reporting <coughs> and to avoid the whole performance problem before it even starts. You don't have to enmesh this idea of analytics with production traffic. You can separate the two and keep the business safe from your CTO. CTOs are great, they're awesome. I don't, I don't it's not a slight against them. Um, so, third example, you work at a mobile phone company. 
you have to give customers reports on total minutes used, total number of phone numbers called, and total amount of data used over any length of time greater than a minute. It's used for reporting billing purposes, AKA it's super important if it's used for billing. And you have 10 million customer records that each generate 1,000 call records per month and you add 80,000 new customers per month. Like these numbers already, like quick estimate, it's already going outside the scope of what a single machine can handle. You're way out of like a single machine's memory. You're way out of even, you're starting to hit some file system limits. Like this much data is probably not gonna fit like on a single machine's file system. Maybe, maybe we, if you actually do something clever. But this is like a hard problem. This is getting into the growth rates unsustainable. The amount of data is way too big to fit into memory. Now, this might be the time that you actually need to worry about building a system. But this is also the time that you should start trying to figure out how to cut down the problem. Looking at what they described and figuring out ways to actually prevent a performance problem, prevent sustainability problems from occurring. So you cheat. You get the people that actually want the analytics, that want the answers to tell you what they want, to give you the constraints that, are, that you're going to introduce to let you have a, a smaller system where you can sacrifice flexibility for sustainability. If somebody says, I need an analytics solution that can give me any answer all the time, that's the worst of solution because you're effectively re rebuilding a SQL database. What you need is to find ways to cut down that problem so you're doing something manageable that a single person or a single team can do within their lifetime. So things you can do to actually recognize the, the constraints and sort of cut it down is the first one's recognize cold data. And we talked about just a second ago the example of call records at a phone company. So there's a, a unique thing about call records is that they're basically events in time. Events in time never change. Events in time never have to be written to again. Once it happened, it never can happen again. It's just an event. So you can recognize that it's cold data and you can aggregate it. You can lose the data as it's written and put it into the larger rollups. Say, I only care about the five minute range or I only care about the 10 minute range and start adding those durations together. This is just an example of a SQL query that actually commits and rolls that up into an aggregate that's effectively like a cache, this monthly usage table. And that thing lets you cut down the read problem. When somebody actually needs to look at their monthly usage, you don't even look at the original call records. The call records are gone, it's not important. You're looking at these aggregates that boiled that thing up as it happened, as it was written. The aggregates are still lossy. Like, and when I say lossy, I say when you add two numbers together, you can never get those numbers back out again. So when you aggregate, you want some way to rebuild the aggregate in case something gets lost. But the principle is sound. As long as you recognize that the data is cold, you can create these things that sort of like write caches, write caches that aggregate data over time. So another thing you can do is scoff at the idea of real time. Um, now, it's, I won't say it's necessarily controversial, but it's, uh, it flies against the face of reason to discuss something uh, called real time because there, there's technically no such thing, at least as far as we're concerned. There's always latencies in between when something occurs and when somebody's actually able to observe it. So taking advantage of that distance of time between when a thing occurred and when it's actually able to be observed, you can introduce latency. You can introduce things like a queue. And by putting things in a queue, queuing data, and having that thing processed in the back end, you can simply say that those, those aggregates, or perhaps cache data, things that I'm going to read to that will become our statistics data, our analytics data, that thing I'll read from some place that allows that latency. I'm going to give old data. I'm going to allow for the fact that when somebody actually gets analytics data, it may be three hours old, it may be four hours old, 10 hours old, however long it took to work off the queue because it doesn't matter. The viewer is the one that, as long as they're able to get some correct data, it's okay. And if you give them an idea of how long it's, how old the data is or how stale the data is, it's still all right. People are still able to make decisions based off of that thing. The idea of real time isn't that important for anything like analytics. It's usually just a, a sales pitch. And the third technique is knowing what you need to know ahead of time. If you know the answers that people are going to want, then you can figure out what data you don't even need to worry about when you're actually doing analytics. If you know that somebody in advance only wants to know about invoice records, then why bother putting any data that has it to do with anything else in the system through your system or even expecting it? 
you filter it out in the front end, and then it just never goes through your analytics pipeline. Then it's done. It's a simple technique, but it allows you to evict whole classes of data that you wouldn't even consider because you're not looking at the database. You're evicting all of it at the front. But the most important thing is to recognize impossibilities when you're confronted with them. Like in all these, all these situations, as somebody actually discusses the idea of, I need an analytic solution, I need to deal with lots of data, I need to deal with big performance problems, sometimes you'll be asked for something that frankly is beyond the capacities of any machine on this earth to actually produce. Like it's simply not possible. And if you can actually inspect what they're asking for, you, for, if you can inspect the data, if you can inspect the rate, get the idea of growth rates, you can do simple napkin math to determine whether or not this thing is even accomplishable or whether it's trivial. But just quickly moving it to the idea of capacities, what can a computer actually do? What's the fastest thing my server is actually possible of? Then you have an idea of what your ceiling is, what's possible, and what you need to benchmark. Because you're finding a way to move it into the realm of reasonable, as opposed to discussing things purely in business terms where they say, we have 5,000 customers, 200 KB uh, payloads, don't worry about it, I just need you to build it and make it fast. Well, as in this example on the slide, that's processing business data at one gigabyte per second, which is awesome, and I hope you have a great job on Wall Street, that's great. Um, that's really hard. So, there's some links that are absolutely useless to everybody sitting on a chair without a computer in front of them. <laughs> Basically, without this computer in front of them. We can pass it around if you want. Um, <laughs> So the other, the other thing uh, that I'm going to mention at the end of this talk, um, at the end of, or at the, sometime in the mid next month? Um, uh, end of September. End of September. Is Plymouth. Programming languages, I believe, may, never mind. Been I, meaning I, to try. Programming languages, I've been meaning to try, but I haven't gotten around to yet. Yes. <laughs> that's that's the one. decided on Plymouth with that. That's a lot better than what I was going to do. Um, that's a thing that's, that's happening down at the Iron Yard. Um, if you're interested in trying out new languages, if you want to play around with something outside of Ruby, or if you want to try some new ideas within Ruby, um, it's a good time to go down and check that out. Um, having said all that, I am happy to talk about hyperloglog. Uh, I'm going to do it all via whiteboard, um, but I will try to I will try to give it credit if anybody's interested in that thing. If nobody is, then I will talk about it with you personally after after this. You, cl you two clearly want to do that thing. All right, I'm sorry if, if you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> That's enough for me, it's not even a majority, but I'm just gonna do it anyway. So. <laughs> Is there an eraser? You know what, uh, there it is. So. This whole day you threw it away. <laughs> this is solar, by the way. This is the thing I was telling you about a little bit for um, quick capacity planning. It's really awesome Like if you're actually going to try to quickly figure out how what you're dealing with. You can deal with the units. Like, uh, if I want to figure out how much something costs per kilobyte, let me see if I can. It's a unit calculator, which is super great, easy for coming up with estimates. In this case, the reason I'm, I'm doing it is to get this ready for the thing I'm about to discuss regarding cardinalities. Um, so quick definitions. Um, when I talk about cardinality, the word I'm using is, is to describe uniqueness. When I say the cardinality of a set of data, I'm saying how unique that data is. So if I have a set like this, its cardinality is three. It has three unique items inside the set, one, two, three. Um, and maybe it's even better to say something like the cardinality is four. It has four distinct items inside the set. This set, trivially, trivially small. At some point, you're going to be dealing with a large set, like a set that is way not sustainable. Like, I'll give you an example that's totally not related to the thing that I'm doing for work right now. Not at all related, believe me. I have to record how many words a person has spelled, each person, uniquely. And I have, per person in my database, I have to worry about something on the order of 
200,000 words, whether or not they spell each of those words uniquely. And I have many, many people, many people, like I can't say how many people, I'm not allowed to, there's <coughs> a lot. Um, and I have to record how, how many words they've uniquely spelled. That, so that amount of data is huge. Doing the calculations, it was in the, the many terabytes of data. It goes way outside of what I can actually put inside the database, and I need to actually store that compactly. So there's this neat thing I can do where I can use what's called a probabilistic data structure. And a probabilistic data structure is something that lets me record things like the cardinality for a set, but it does it by introducing the idea of error. If I allow for some percentage of error for that, for that estimate, like if I said, okay, magic data structure, it's probabilistic. What's the cardinality of this set? It would say, oh, five. That's not right. It's totally not right. But it's close. It's close within some percentage. You know, it's, it's, and in fact, for some of these data structures, probabilistic data structures, there is a formula for the error bounds. So you understand how much error you get for how much space you intend to take. So the structure that we're talking about, hyperlog log, has something on the order of, I think the, how it's set up is 0.3% error rate. And you can tune it based on how much space you intend to take up. So for 0.3% error rate, for one kilobyte of space, I can have cardinalities for sets in the, I think, many, many millions. So I can, I can record unique items like I need in this case, but I can do it at one kilobyte. So what that means is, is that the naive implementation, let's say one kilobyte, So we'll say 32 bits is a reasonable thing for an identifier for a unique item in any set. It's just an integer. So for that amount, one kilobyte would naturally hold 250 unique items. But somehow we've managed to make that one kilobyte instead give us one or many millions of unique items. The cardinality for many uh, millions of unique items. And it does that. by exploiting this neat behavior in numbers. Now before we get too far into this, this is, um, I'll just define it. So there's this thing called a hash function. Um, if you've not encountered it before, it's basically like a function, takes in some string or some anything really, any, any stream of bytes. And it gives you a number. That's what you can think of it. The very, the, at the most naive level, you get a number from anything, from a string, from any stream of bytes that would be in your system. Now, the behavior of hash functions is kind of unique in that it gives you uniform numbers across a huge space. So you get number, uniform numbers that seem to be random from anything. So if I said F A, I would get 32. F B, don't worry, these aren't actually the real hash values. I would get something like 107. The thing that you take from this is that these numbers don't have any relation to them, while these numbers are, or these bytes, are proximal to each other. These bytes are close to each other, like this is, you know, A, B, B comes right after A. These things no longer have any relationship, and B consistently hashes to this number. So you get sort of a randomish behavior passing these, these values into hash functions, and That is great for us because we're able to take these things that we're going to put inside of our hyperlog log, the items from our various, the, the set that has lots of unique data, in my case, words, and we get these numbers. And in the case of 32, if you, um, if you render that as binary, it looks like something like this. I know that somebody out there is going to fall on this. This is probably actually 32. Don't worry about that. So you get this. So now you have, if, you, if you're looking at this, this hash number, you have this pattern. And what hyperloglog lets us do is it we will actually take, we'll cut off part of the number, we'll look at the number of beginning zeros, and we'll use that as a way to select a bucket inside that one kilobyte of space. 
And once we've done that, and we've selected our bucket, this thing, we have three zeros, so it's going to select bucket number three. Then we take this number, and we look at the number that's already here. And this number here, now that we've chopped off the, the zeros, this is still 32, I think. So we insert that into our bucket because there's nothing there yet. We're going to keep on doing this with every member of the set that comes in. When a new member comes in, if it perhaps maps to this bucket, we'll look at the number that's already here and the number that we want to put into it, and we'll choose the maximum between the two. Now what this is doing is it's exploiting the fact that the numbers that are going to be coming into this, because they've gone through a hash function, are essentially random. They're going to be, they're not always going to map into the same bucket. So there's a probability, decreasing probability, that those numbers will actually collide. That's where the probability comes, that's where the error rate comes from. So we're exploiting the probability of random numbers actually colliding inside of our buckets. And then once we've done that, we we'll actually have this whole collection of numbers here. We'll get the harmonic mean, which I'm, I can't even explain it because I really don't, I don't understand it very well. Um, but anyways, we'll get the harmonic mean of all those numbers, which will produce the estimate for the cardinality of the set. And what the most amazing part is, is that these things, writing to these things, is, basic, is an operation that can happen oblivious to the rest of the members of the set, so you can write to it without knowing what the rest of the set actually has inside of it, which is, is a perfect place to be for, for uh, they're called blind writes. Anyways, I hope, I hope that the three of, three of the people that were into that <laughs> really enjoyed that. And I'd say I'm sorry for the rest of you, but I was the one who did it, so I guess I'm not sorry.